All right, guys. So today we're going to talk about the rotary engine. So as you can see here, we have a basic design, the most basic design, you know, you, you can't see any cooling passages, oil, nothing. The most basic design for how a rotary, rotary engine works. As we can see, I have again drawn the most basic engine layout and labeled the parts right here. So if we can see, number one is your intake which would be your intake port. And you can see there the little orange, that would be your fuel mixture with the blue being the air. This big part right here would be considered the, the, the I guess you can say the intake chamber, I guess, because rotary engines, I've seen them being classified as four stroke engines, uh, but um, I've also seen them widely classified as two strokes uh you know given that these are strokeless engines these don't have strokes whatsoever so it's kind of hard to you know pinpoint exactly you know at some parts you can yeah you can call them a four stroke and then at some other parts in their function you can call them a two stroke but to assign them a stroke or cycle function is kind of disingenuous given that it has no strokes whatsoever so before we get into how it works let's just keep labeling number two right here is your exhaust port that'll be your exhaust chamber number three is your stator housing or just the housing the stator housing is any housing that that um contains a part that's spinning right so if you have your like a turbo and you have the impeller spinning that housing that covers the impeller is called the, the, the stator or the stator housing. Number four, the spark plugs. I think that uh, most, if not all, of Mazda uh, Wankel engines, uh, rotary engines are called Wankel engines after their inventor, uh, use the two spark plugs per, per rotor. Number five is your eccentric shaft. So, if you can see that bigger circle right there was my was my pen. My bigger that bigger circle right there is your crankshaft. Or what you would consider an eccentric shaft. Because it looks and functions more like a camshaft. And it is a lot smaller than a crankshaft. And then you see this one right here. These this little circle and this little circle do not lie on the same plane. They're not the same circle. I just drew them like that to show how they, they 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 do spin together. Feel me? So the way it looks is you have, you know, your shaft here. And then over here, just like a camshaft, you have a lobe sort of sticking out. And this lobe is what connects to that gear. Feel me? So it's like sort of like connected, you know, like a lobe to the shaft. Right, and it's offset. So that's your eccentric shaft or your crankshaft. Number six would be your pinion gear, and number seven would be your crown gear. So as the rotor, people call it the Dorito, as the rotor spins, this gear forces this gear to roll as well. But they are geared in a one to three, meaning for every one revolution, of, of the uh, rotor, this spins three times, meaning that for every one revolution of the every one revolution of the rotor, the crankshaft will spin three times. What's next? So then we have okay, <laughs> number eight is the rotor, the Dorito. Number nine, right here. I don't know if you can see them. That those bits in purple or the apex seals, right? So those work analogously to your compression and your oil rings on your pistons. And these kind of move like this on the rotor. To fill up as the rotor rotates, it fills up those gaps to some extent. Um, this is a, 
I, I guess, the point of failure for Wankles. And uh, these do wear out a lot, all the time, a lot more than your rings on a piston. And um, after some, I don't know how many miles, but after, and, and depending on how you use it, but after some time using your rotary engine, you do have to take it apart and, you know, periodically replace your your apex seals. And along with that, I don't know if you can see that brown right there at the apex seals, right? That little brown right there is your oil film. So that oil lubricates everything else. You know, that little space between your apex seal and the stator housing and just the, the sides, etc. you know, keeps that lubricated. And then number 10 is just your combustion chamber. At what we will call a combustion chamber. Here we have some nice things. Uh, um, rotary engines have a constant power delivery. Three power pulses per rotation of the rotor. The eccentric shaft is geared so for one rotation of the shaft, one power pulse is delivered to the eccentric shaft. Therefore, it spins three times faster than the rotor. And then it has no reciprocating parts. That's... You know, people always say, why are rotary engines so much more, uh, I guess you could say, powerful, uh, so much more powerful than, uh, you know, your traditional piston engines. And I wouldn't necessarily call them more powerful than a piston engine. Just uh, you, 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 you deliver your power a lot more constantly. Um and uh, for for the displacement of the engine, which is something we'll get on a little later, for the displacement of the engine, they do produce more power per displacement. And, and of course, per weight. These things are tiny. Most of these engines are just two cylinders. I mean, not two cylinders, two rotors. And uh, those two rotors produce, shoot, those two rotors by themselves, engines from like the 80s produce way more power than my 2017 Corolla, which is a four piston and it has like twice the displacement. So, you know, that's that's pretty dope. Um, these can be taken to hella horsepower, like, you know, in drift applications and such, but for such driving, you would be constantly taking it apart and replacing those apex seals, for sure, for sure. So if we can see here, the cool thing about these engines is that intake, compression, combustion, and exhaust occur simultaneously feel me in my other video you saw how i labeled the degrees of motion of the piston and then you know 90 degrees is intake 90 degrees is compression combustion and then exhaust right here you've got everything's being done at the same time simultaneously and constantly so as combustion begins here there's already exhaust going out and there's already intake incoming and as this rotates as this rotates it's already drawing in compressing exhausting and as it reaches here it begins combustion exhaust and then finish intake and repeats the cycle this is just one rotor imagine two so it's just constant power delivery so the the reason this shaft is geared as so is again like i said here so for every one rotation of your crankshaft of your output shaft you have one combustion so while, yes, while the Dorito, imagine this part. Well, this part goes all the way around and come back in, comes back in. This would have done three combustion cycles. Meanwhile, your shaft would have spun once for every combustion. Uh, as it says here, there's no reciprocating parts, meaning there's no parts that go up and down. There's no valves that have to open. Um, as you can see here, the Dorito, I mean, <laughs> the rotor itself closes and opens the ports um i don't know if there are any of these that have uh like injection into the chamber i, I think they're all port injected and uh you know the, this these engines have improved stability improved balance uh so they're smooth as you know smooth as hell um they barely suffer from knock i mean they it does happen but you know not to the degree of piston engines they, I mean, they're, they're pretty great engines, not going to lie. They're pretty dope. If, if you can maintain them and take care of them as you should. Um, 
downsides would be that oh and these these engines are famous for for being able to rev so high given that everything is literally just rotating there's no reciprocating mass these engines you know while your average uh you know four stroke piston engine will go from a conservative let's say 5000 rpm redline to a 7.5 or 1000 rpm redline you know and then you have like sports cars that are like 8000 rpm to like 10000 rpm and then you have like race cars that can go up to 12000 rpm of the redline you know that's like child's play for these engines feel me like like a 10,000 RPM redline is could be common for for a tuned, you know, rotary engine. Or even bone stock engines can easily reach 8, 9,000 RPM. You know, the 12,000 RPM of like freaking F1 engines are like minimum entry level redline for freaking competitive uh, rotary engines. You feel me? Like these things, <laughs> these things spin like hell. Many downsides to the rotary design being that um, not just that you have to constantly be taking care of it, not just like oh babying it, like no, like you have to constantly like every, you know how we do, let's say every five thousand miles you do an oil change. Well, here like let's say every fifty thousand miles you gotta open this bitch up, take the rotor out, and re replace your uh, apex seals. Um, they they do burn a lot of oil as you can see that film there this engine by design burns oil i don't know if it's true for all rotary engines all wankel rotary engines but i know that some i think some mazda rotary engines have their own supply of oil for the apex seals right so there's a entirely different reservoir of oil for the apex seals and an entire different reservoir for the rest of the oil used for operation that way you don't have to constantly be refilling that you know, and the entire rest of the engine doesn't run out of that necessary oil. I don't know if that's necessarily true for all rotary Wankel engines. But uh, yeah, be mindful of that. So it burns oil. Uh, they are less fuel efficient. Uh, the more, the faster they spin at the higher RPMs, they really lose efficiency. And uh, there's a lot of unburned fuel and a lot of unburned hydrocarbons, given the design of I think it's called the peritrochroid, just the design of the uh, rotor itself. As it spins faster, there's just a lot less time for combustion. And, and as you can see, the flame, you know, as we saw in the pist in a piston engine, the flame kind of propagates this way all evenly, right? As it spreads down through the piston. Here, as the rotor is spinning this way, combustion is spreading that way, this way, right? And then the rotor just spins so fast that it kind of just clips out this entire face and it kind of like can snuff out the flame if it's going way too fast. So it just, a lot of unburnt fuel goes out through here. There, there, there are some systems that Mazda came up to limit this fuel, uh, not the fuel efficiency problem. They did come up with fuel efficiency problems, you know, solves, not solves, solve fixes, but they emissions there we go emissions is the big problem they did come up with some systems of a sort of afterburner effect right when it goes to what you can call the catalytic converter some japanese models of the wankel um were made to run rich with more fuel that way all that excess fuel that goes into the catalytic converter i think before that there's like a a, a, a thermodynamic damp or something not a damp but um let's just say it's like an afterburner right all that fuel gets burned up in the uh exhaust and uh before it reaches the cats and that that helps a lot with emissions so let's get to the problem you know uh, the big controversy i guess you can say around displacement you know a lot of people will say that they will try to calculate displacement by by what's called the swept volume meaning the volume of anything of the just the volume of each of these faces of the piss of the rotor right that it can you know spin through one of its rotations so they would take the volume of each of these quote-unquote chambers and multiply them by three but that's sort of disingenuous because as, again as we've talked about only one power pulse is felt per one rotation of the crankshaft 
So it's sort of disingenuous to, to, you know, calculate it like that. The way it's, I guess you can say, officially, officially uh, measured, and it was, you know, measured by the Mazda engineers and still measured today by Mazda and stuff, is with this formula, the stroke volume, which I found on, on a book about rotary engines. And um, this only takes account for that one phase of the rotor. So we have the volume is equal to three times the square root of three ERB, where E is eccentricity or the offset from the center lobe to the crankshaft. So how offset that little lobe that attaches to that, um, I think it's the, the pinion gear, how much is it offset from the actual crankshaft? R is the radius of the rotor to the tip. So from radius of road, uh, center of rotor to this tip. And B is just the width of the rotor. They're, they're, these are pretty thick. They're like this thick or, or more. They're, they're hefty things. I think they're definitely heavier than your pistons. Uh, oh, another thing. Since there's no reciprocating masses, these engines don't lose that much power compared to a, a traditional piston engine when, you know, rotating. Piston engines lose a lot of power from, from that stuff. Um... Yeah, in the book I read, uh, wow, like, they go into hella detail on how to calculate all this stuff. Like, it's it's, it's insane how they, they calculate this stuff. But that's basically the formula. And then here I have a quote. Nearly all Mazda Wankel engines share a single rotor radius, 105 millimeters, and a width of a hundred, oh, with a, a 15 millimeter offset. Right? So then we have here the Mazda cars that have, these are not the only ones that have the Wankel engine, but these are the ones everybody know. We have the first gen RX-7, the SA, with a 1.1 liter 12, 12A and the 12A turbo and a 1.33 liter 13B. We have the second gen, the FC RX-7, with a 1.3 liter 13B and the, and the turbo. We have the FD RX-7, which is the third gen, 1.3 liters, 13B. And then we have the RX-8, which is the 1.3 liter and the 13B with its specific model. Up here we have, again, we have the measurements, the tool rotor for the 12A, the 13B Resi, which is rotary engine super injection, which the intake port is kind of shaped in a way that when, when this spins, this air kind of sucks in and it, it creates a natural, like, vacuum like a suck in power that it's much more pronounced than your traditional scavenging from a piston engine uh same measurements it's just the rotor width was increased by 10 millimeters the D dei it has variable intake systems and it has twin scroll turbo is that just means that the turbo has two different i guess you can say intakes for both accounting for both rotors um, the 13B REW has sequential turbos and the primary turbo spins from uh, from and up to 4,500 RPM. And then the secondary takes on after that. Uh, the 13B MSP Renesis is the multi-site port, shares pretty much these exact variants. Uh, they come in turbo, non-turbo, etc. So if you pretty much just calculate the volume Oh, shit. I'm going to have to get my calculator. <laughs> I can't do the square root of 3 in my head. I don't know that. All right, y'all. Bear with me. I'm going to put you guys down. Jeez. All right, I'm back, y'all. Before we get into that, I wanted to mention that here, the 13B motor is not related to the 13A. It is, however, an elongated version of the 12A engine, right? So if we for a calculator here, follow our formula, we have, right? We have three square root of three times ERB. So let's use, um, let's use our RX-7 engine. So we have, we have 105 times 15 times, what is it? It's an 80 millimeter times 80 millimeters cube. We plug that into our, oh shit, this is hard looking at through the camera. All right, so we do 
one square root of three, 105 times 15 times 80. So we get six, five, four, seven, one, five millimeters cubed. And I know that over there I have it equals one millimeter cubed equals 10 to the minus six liters. So then this turns to, damn it, answer times 10 to the minus six. Oh shit, my bad. Uh, six, five, four, seven, one, five. Let me see if it lets me do it like that, because my iPhone lets me do it. There we go, yeah. So we have zero, yeah, we basically just moved the decimal. Six, five, five, let's say, liters. And then that's per rotor, and there's two rotors. So then we have, we have a 1.31, 1.3 liter engine. There we go. So that's how that's calculated. And people will often say that, you know, to get the same power of a 1.3 liter uh, Wankel engine or whatever, you need like a 2.4 liter piston engine and stuff like that. And it, it it's it's true. And then a lot of quote unquote haters would be like, no, 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 because you're only calculating one phase. You got to calculate for the three. And then when you do that, you actually find out that your actual displacement is 2.8 liters and such. And it's like, bruh. <laughs> feel me it's like you're like you're just finding excuses and then here i have just some basic stats that i could find the naturally aspirated 12a engine it's a 1.1 liter carb rated 130 horsepower 150 pound feet of torque uh it has a dry weight of 384 that's a 0.339 power to weight ratio it can easily rev up to 8,000 rpm the Turbo 12A was replaced with injection, electronic injection, with 165 horsepower, 170 pound-feet of torque. And that would bring, assuming the weight is the same, it would bring it up to 0 0.43 power-to-weight ratio. The 13B Resi has 135 horsepower, 133 pound-feet of torque. The 13B DEI has 185 and 183. The 13B REW has 255 to 280 horsepower. And... You know, depending on like their turbo versions and such. The 13B MSP from the RX-7 can produce 211 to 235 horsepower and 247 pound-feet of torque. That would equal to 0 0.854 to 0 0.951 power-to-weight ratio. It has reduced fuel consumption and better emissions. So that's basically my explanation of the Mazda rotary engine. Because... Those are only the ones I care about. <laughs> there are other people and other companies that make rotaries, I guess. But uh, Mazda, Mazda is Mazda's the way to go with rotaries. Yeah, it's not uncommon to see people swapping out, you know, 13Bs into their cars and such. And, uh, you know, if you if you want, you can get crazy. And, like, you know, you don't need to just have two rotors. You can... Those things are pretty tiny, so if you have the space and you can fit four, five, six, freaking as many rotors as you want, that, that'd be great. That'd be amazing, but you're basically just combining these engines and then you'd be making hella power. Hella power at, at, at a higher rev, so it's amazing, it's amazing. That's another reason that, that people also say that they make a lot more power is that nine times out of ten, again, your horsepower increases in your rpm range you know there is a drop off but naturally speaking if you can rev higher you can generate more power so that's pretty dope i, I know a kid that wants to put uh i think 213 i don't know if it was 213 uh b engines into his miata or just one of them i don't remember but i'm pretty sure with how tiny they are if, with some fabrication in there you can probably fit them if they put LS engines and freaking V12 and all that crap in, in Miatas, you can probably fit two 13Bs in there. So, yeah, I mean, as long as you take care of those Apex seals and replace them periodically, you're good. You're good to go. So that's it, noobs. Um, maybe later I'll make a video on how uh, transmissions work. Never done one of those. Haven't looked more that much into transmissions. I know how they work. I know their layout, but... 
they're pretty fucking complicated. <laughs> I love how, like, a lot of card dudes, and myself included, that I know, were like, yeah, we can, you know, draw you an engine and know how it works, etc. Uh, we know how trannies work, but then it's like, do you want to work with a tranny? You're like, nah, bro, nah. Transmissions, I don't want to touch that shit. <laughs> but yeah, guys, um, thanks. Bye, guys.